morning, everyone, and thank you very much to Dr. Rudd for the invitation to be here. Um, so I will talk a little bit about S uh, science, technology, and innovation for SDG 12, mostly. But I think it can apply to all SDGs as well. Uh, I work under the UN Environment Asia and the Pacific Office, and I am lucky to work with Puja in the Switch Asia program, which is funded by the EU. So that whole program is dedicated to sustainable consumption and production. Uh, so this is, this is the program website, and the overall objective is to strengthen dialogue at regional, sub-regional, and, and the national policies on sustainable consumption and production in Asia. So I'm going to share some insights from our, the our work we did last year under Switch Asia on innovative solutions, circular economy, and low-carbon lifestyles. So the consumption side of SCP is in the low-carbon lifestyles and the production side also under the circular economy. So innovation for SCP in different words. Branding is everything. <laughs> okay, so first I'm gonna talk about uh, technologies, innovation, and science as separate entry points. So one thing I want to talk about is technologies being underpinned by complex supply chains. We know that technologies are going to be good for the environment overall, but there are some things to think about. One is, well, it's a little joke, but I, I wonder whether technology can lead to increased population because now we have uh, applications like Tinder where we can all meet each other and have nice conversation and then, oh, there's a baby. And uh, in a one person's lifetime, this baby will lead to 2,800 tons of material use using our resource use data, 2,000 tons of carbon footprint, 20,000 gigajoules of energy and a quarter of a million, almost kiloliters of water. Ooh, technology's not looking good so far. But really, that was just an excuse to talk about mobile phones because there's, they're the basis of most of our technology. So I want to talk a little bit about the hardware before we get to the, the software. So the first thing to note is that mobile phones and all of the technologies underpinning our technology systems, the cables, the wires, the computers, the data centers, they're based on a linear economy model where we take a metal ore, we produce um, beautiful technologies, but they do all end up as waste and not very much of that can be recycled. So there's a few reasons that keeps us up at night and makes us concerned, and we think this needs to be taken into account. One is geological scarcity. There's a lot of debate around that. Uh, are we going to run out of materials for all of our uh, mobile phones and technologies? Well, one of the data points we look at is the ore grade, the concentration of the material like copper in the ore that we take out of the ground. And what we see is that it's declining. We are now, we're about here, we're now happy to extract ores with a much lower concentration of materials. That means you need a lot more energy, water, and disruption to the environment for the same amount of metals. The other thing is called geographic scarcity. So maybe we have the materials, but they're in very difficult or awkward places. Uh, one of the indicators is the amount of mining and community conflict. Right? So what we see is from uh, 2002 to 2013, um, the number of incidents of conflict with the mining community increase. So one, that can be many reasons. One is that the deposits that we're now interested in uh, could be under communities, they could be under forests, or they could be under infrastructure. Uh, and we've, we, they're not renewable, so we can't go back to the deserts or other places that are, that are, um, th that are uh, less of a problem and go back there. Um, Sometimes they're in really awkward places. So sometimes I ask, what does an asteroid, the deep sea, and a cute Swedish town have in common? Well, one thing is they're all prime sites for mining now. So asteroids are now a source for materials, as well as deep sea, especially in the Pacific. 
Um, and even in a country like Sweden, they're willing to move an entire uh, small village to make room for iron ore. Iron ore is not even a scarce material, but they're willing to disrupt the community. Another one is geopolitical scarcity. So we, we, I think a lot of people saw this headline that in 2012, uh, the world realized that China produces 97% of rare earth elements, which are critical elements for renewable energy, um, uh, battery technology, and even our phones. Um, and China decided that it did not want to export as many of these critical minerals, which led to a geopolitical conflict. And even Angela Merkel, the head of state of Germany, had to travel to China to renegotiate access to the minerals. So geopolitical scarcity is a problem when countries have monopoly on critical minerals that are essential to our technologies. So what this tells us is that, sorry Dr. Adam, I mean, she's here, okay. <laughs> uh, what this tells us is that we need to move away from a linear economy where we keep expecting new sources of this. And we need to see this e-waste um, or the existing materials in our society as the raw materials for our technologies. The good thing is that industry is already starting the process. So this is Apple's robot Daisy. Um, she can disassemble 200 iPhones in an hour. Um, and Apple has committed to only using renewable resources or recycled materials in the future when they make their iPhones or other, whatever the gadget is. Are we wearing it in our eyes or I don't know. Uh, so this is the good news. Uh, so that's the point about technologies. Caution, we need them to become circular. Now, innovations, I want to focus here on how innovations can support sustainable consumption and production, and I'm going to focus on digital technologies. So, let's move to software. Um, so, the first one is big data and the Internet of Things. So, big data refers to data sets that are so big and complex that we can't use an Excel spreadsheet anymore. So we can't even use a regular computer anymore, but we need, um, uh, we need supercomputers and algorithms. Um, and this is happening because we're putting more and more sensors everywhere. One of the sensors um, is our phones, which gives some extraordinary insights into our uh, location, our movements, our purchases, um, m many different things. But uh, you can't really handle that data in a, an Excel spreadsheet. Um, and the Internet of Things is another term that refers to a network of smart, interconnected devices and services that can sense or listen to requests or needs and then act on them. They can also monitor metrics like air and water quality, energy consumption, temperature and traffic flows. So this is what happens when everything is now becoming connected and we can actually access the data. And I saw yesterday on Facebook that farms in Thailand are starting to use sensors and artificial intelligence to plan their um, uh, fertilization and water use on the farm. So another example is the, uh, of, of this is from our region is Manila Electric Co, which wants to install 3.3 smart meters into homes. Now smart meter um, will help give you data about your own household energy use or if you're in a, uh, a hotel or office building, also the office building use. So normally, I think you and I, we get a bill at the end of the month, so we get one data point and we skip the kilowatt hours and we go to the how much we have to pay and we pay. It's not a lot of feedback to our own behavior so it, it's difficult to know even how much does the fridge cost or how much the washing machine. But with smart meters you'll get much more information about w how you're using electricity and how you can reduce energy consumption. So this is an example of Internet of Things converting information from our lives into uh, digital data and then connecting it. The second technology I want to talk about is blockchain and it became quite popular I think about 18 months ago. 
and then all the cryptocurrencies went up and everyone got excited and now they're <laughs> really down. I actually bought uh, cryptocurrency on the peak cost day and it went whoop down. So I, <laughs> okay, so <laughs> it was a good lesson. I didn't buy much. Um, but basically when someone described blockchain to me is if you have the internet, um, um, if, block, if, if you have the World Wide Web being the internet, blockchain is the World Wide Ledger. So it's as if all of the financial transactions that we do every day uh, could be connected to a global um, system. And then, um, so the blocks of new information added, old blocks can't be changed, uh, but you can insert corrections, you can layer them on. Um, and then transactions of blockchain are performed across a network. And there's no need for a central intermediary. So it turns out this has a lot of um, potential applications for uh, SCP. Um, one is the uh, enabling peer-to-peer -peer clean energy sharing. And we've seen a trial in Bangkok's Sukhumvit neighborhood. We also support a startup ourselves that does this. So the idea is that if ev in the future everything facing the sun will be a solar panel hopefully. And everyone will be driving electric vehicles or using electric vehicles. So the idea is that to make mini grids where individuals can trade energy with each other rather than going through a centralized energy authority. Now if you have potentially billions and billions of energy transactions, it can be better to manage, it can be be difficult to manage those transactions on a regular centralized system, but a peer-to-peer -peer system can make it a lot easier, more efficient, more transparent. And if you eventually want to add a carbon price, you need some sort of guarantee of w that your electricity is coming from a green source or not. The second one is supply chain transparency. So if all the, all the transactions are connected, I buy the uh, pointer from the supermarket, the supermarket buys the pointer from the electronics company, electronics company buys components, components companies buy the materials and so on. Um, you can then add all of their transactions. Did they buy electricity? Was that electricity green? Did they buy minerals? Did they buy uh, buildings? Whatever they bought, you can be added and aggregated on the transaction ledger so that when you, when you purchase the item, you can get a complete picture of the carbon footprint or other metrics. I think that's quite, quite ex exciting, that one. Um, so there is one company called Provenance, and they're doing this for the tuna industry. Um, okay. Um, so another one is tokenizing recycling. So another thing that blockchain can do is give you tokens in lieu of currency. And those tokens can then be traded or cashed in. Um, carbon footprinting, I maybe already mentioned that. Another one is rewarding good behavior. So Good Chain is set up by ScanTrust in Thailand, actually, the manager is in Thailand. And so what he's offering is that um, uh, regular brands, uh, maybe Central Group or something like this, can um, give customers tokens to use for charities of their choice. And they can do it through the blockchain. Uh, and that enables charity as well. Okay, I might have to speed up. Um, artificial intelligence. Uh, the EU has said that artificial intelligence and circular economy are the two big priorities. We need to get them right. So artificial intelligence and different technologies like machine learning refer to technologies that can analyze enormous volumes of data and automate decision making and complete tasks. So there's a lot of potential here in the transport sector, self-driving cars that can uh, kind of communicate with each other, figure out where everyone's going, and then optimize everyone's route to minimize carbon footprint and traffic congestions. Uh, you can also use this in farms, and so there's one example, I didn't know about the Thai example when I wrote this, but I think in the future it would be nice to include the Thai farm here. But you can optimize seed investments, fertilization, and crop performance. 
So lastly, I want to just talk about science because it's a lot of the collaboration that we have with Dr. Rudd and Doc, Dr. Jiti. Um, so using science to understand uh, whether something is dis sustainable or not. So we uh, did life cycle assessments for all of the uh, startups in our Asia Pacific um, Low Carbon Lifestyles Challenge last year. I think we don't have time for the video probably, but um, what we did was we looked for startups that could make our lifestyles more sustainable. So these were looking at low carbon lifestyles, uh, low carbon mobility, energy efficiency. One of them was linking block, uh, solar panels to electric vehicles. So we had three questions. What is the difference in carbon footprint between an internal combustion engine, an e-vehicle powered by the grid, and an e-vehicle powered by solar power? So Kun uh, Jiti and Kun Nong uh, did the work. <laughs> and uh, do I have it? Yeah, okay. So we did a life cycle assessment in a streamlined and we did really apply the um, international methodology. And what we found is that it depends. We found an internal combustion engine car traveling 30 kilometers, four liters of, of uh, fuel per kilo 100 kilometers, will, basic, will end up uh, with 4.4 kilograms of carbon footprint emissions in one day. Now, we switched that one to the grid in Thailand. If we can get 16.6 .6 kilowatt hours per 100 kilometers, so it depends on your car, but if they're all the same, um, you can almost half that, so you'll only have 53% of the carbon footprint, so that's pretty good. However, if you put the same car in China, they have a much higher carbon footprint per kilowatt hour because their energy system is based on coal, you have a higher carbon footprint than your internal combustion engine with 5.5. So that's a very big, um, that was an er a very interesting finding for us because China is leading the e-vehicle revolution. So China needs to work on this one here. Lastly, what happens if you can connect the solar vehicle through your charging stations to local solar power? Well, you only need 0.4 kilograms of carbon emissions. So all of a sudden, we get only 9% of the carbon footprint compared to uh, the grid. So this type of information is very important for policymakers because when we present a startup and you say, I'm going to use blockchain, I'm going to connect the solar power to the e-vehicle charging stations, you sort of wonder why, why are you doing this? You really need the evidence base to explain why this is connected to carbon footprint emissions. So we really appreciate the, the work of the Lifecycle Lab um, and also the other things that you mentioned on the looky waste, the other ways. We really do need to understand the carbon footprint of our consumption and production decisions so we can choose the optimal ones. Okay, that's all I want to say. So thank you very much. Thank you all. Thanks, Dr. Rudd.